Hey, what is up? Thanks for watching this video. Before we get into it, these guys are big buck killers. John has killed three 200 inch deer. Michael has killed some deer in the upper 180s and uh, they're great people and we're happy to be associated with them and um, we're glad that they're a part of Exodus. So you'll learn all about how they got involved with Exodus and also they talk a lot about deer hunting. So we hope you guys enjoy this video. Before we get into it, be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit like if you do enjoy it and drop us a comment um, of what you think about the interview. We are gonna be releasing a new series called Whitetail Cribs in the very near future and their home will be one of the one of the first ones of the the first series that we release. So we guys we really hope you guys enjoy this. Let's go ahead and get into it. Lights camera follow the trail ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera if you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. We are sitting in the home of John and Michael Height, um, co-owners of Exodus. And for a lot of listeners, this is probably the first time that you may be hearing their names or if you're watching watching this on YouTube, probably the first time seeing their glamorous faces, Michael's beautiful face. Um, but there's probably a lot of folks out there that have uh, seen you guys at trade shows or events and, you know, seen you working behind the booth or whatnot, talking to people, mingling, packaging out cameras and not really drawing the conclusion of being part owners or owners of, of Exodus. Um, and for a business, there's always, regardless of what business you're in, there's always a lot of moving parts. There's all this stuff that gets done behind, uh, closed doors and things that are done by people who aren't always like in the limelight or spotlight, not getting the attention. And for us, you guys do so much of that for us, whether it's, um, dealing and testing with firmware dealing with shipments, order fulfillments when we get really super, super busy. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, for anyone listening, you guys are kind of two of the un, un, unsung heroes, uh, I guess, for <laughs> if that's what you want to call it. One way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> so introduce, John, you go first, but introduce yourself to uh, the listeners, who you are, where you're from, reside, the story of building – your other business, what you do for a living, I guess, and how you built that business, um, involvement in Clear Creek Construction now, and then Michael, you can you can follow follow that up. It works for me. I'm John Height. Um, we live in southeastern Ohio. Lived there all of our lives. Within a few counties, I guess. Uh, I started Clear Creek Construction about 21 years ago. Started out in my garage. Just me and another guy slowly build up to where we're a mechanical contractor. We do a lot of piping, welded pipe, a lot of paper mill stuff, ethanol plants in the uh, Ohio area and surrounding states. We've got about 40 employees now, and I've kind of worked myself into a position of not doing near as much as I used to, <laughs> having a lot more time to hunt now and play. Um, I kind of enjoy that. That's it's worked out okay. That's uh, I think for so many so many people just consider that like the American dream: starting a business, going to work for somebody else, realizing, hey, this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. Going out on your own, building a successful business, and then being able to, you know, reap the rewards of that ten, fifteen, twenty years later, and be able to in enjoy your middle age. I, I highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also a lot harder than yeah, the first what it looks like from the outside. 10 or 12 years of doing this is you live, eat, and sleep it, and right. there's nothing. Everything revolves around work. Hunt occasionally when you have time. You know, I go, I went from like 2006 to almost eight years without ever shooting a deer, mm -hmm. you know, so work come first. Yeah, a lot of sacrifice so. there. So... Michael, I guess it, growing up, dad's running the business, growing the business. What's, uh, I guess, what's your role with Clear Creek? Like, tell us a story of um, you kind of 
following your dad's footsteps, learning learning the trade as the pipe fitter, welder, and learning piping, mechanical contracting. Well, I don't know. How I think old was you I? Pretty well I summed it up. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> How old was I when I started going to the shop? Twelve. Uh, yeah, you're pretty young. So I was pushing broom when I was twelve or so. What until I was eighteen, I'd go on the job sites. Yeah, we actually we snuck you on a little bit before that. Not many times. But yeah, some. on occasion. But uh, now I take care of a couple facilities for the most part. We just finished up big shutdown. We had forty eight guys at. That was a week long shutdown. Um, I run a little bit of work still physically doing quite a bit to myself so i haven't got into his position yet so he's got to hunt all season i've, I've sat one day <laughs> you're I just have uh, a little bit you're paying your dues that's part of well, it right yeah that's part hoping of to it. retire by the time i'm 35 and then then be able to hunt from there it's <laughs> my goal We're, it's probably not gonna work out but i don't do you ever have any desire to move out of the basement uh i think i'd milk that out till i'm 30 a couple more years Three more years. Three more years. Until you're 30 or for 30 years? Well, I don't know. It depends how long mom will let me yeah. stay down there and do my laundry. So anyone uh, anyone listening to this or watching this on YouTube, make sure you watch the White Tail Cribs episode with these two. You'll, you'll get a kick and uh, get a kick out of it and, and realize what, what these two are talking about. Um, so how do, um, I guess, Michael, give us a, give us a little backstory how you guys – um, became involved with Exodus, the you know, um, from being first-time customers to you know owning owning part of the business. Well, um, I think probably your first batch of cameras you got. We ended up with one out of. We were we had a bunch of cameras starting shit out, and we were trying to find something that was going to last. So we tried a handful of different cameras that year, and this is actually the one we decided to go with. I think we bought 15 from you. Met you at. Uh, the Ohio Tur- Deer and Turkey Expo, picked those up. Wasn't long after that, I was like, well, we need more cameras. We ran a bunch of cameras. And uh, Deer Asic bought 15 more from you. I think that was when we got to bullshitting a little bit, talking money and what have you. And you guys were ready to start working on your cell cams. I think you are looking for a little capital for that, and that's when Dad got involved. So that would have been... 2016, I think. I think you're Probably. right. Probably, yeah. Because I think you guys, uh, I think you guys had bought some cameras off us in 15. Seen you over the winter at the uh, Deer and Turkey Expo, probably in the spring of 16. Yeah, I, I think that and sounds right. Met you at Deer Asic. Yep. And we just thought, I remember. I actually, I remember that conversation. I'm glad you do. Uh, well, that's, <laughs> that's what I was going to get to. Uh, <laughs> Run into you, you know, you're hanging out at the booth, BS, and and then we had that conversation about, you know, cell cameras and whatnot. And uh, you, so you walked away. Somebody was like, "Who who's that guy?" And I was like, "I don't know, some, some kid having fun." <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, I still remember that's kind of kind of funny. Yeah. But I guess um, to get to I guess deer talk, you guys it seems like are always on big deer, killing big deer. Um, and I guess let's just, let's just start with that. John, give us your, I guess, so, so-called whitetail resume, um, how long you've been hunting, bow hunting, give us a rundown of that. And then Michael, you can follow, follow up. Well, I've been hunting since I was a kid, you know, and I guess I shot my first Ohio big buck in gun season of, uh, back in like 83. That goes back a while. You're telling and your age now. Huh? You're telling your um, age now. Fairly old. <laughs> uh, and then before that, I bow hunted a little bit, but I got into bow hunting more after that. And, you know, you start shooting 120, 30 inch deer, and you're pretty happy with that. And as the years go on, you try to shoot bigger deer and bigger deer. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough to live in an area, and, and the only place I've ever hunted was southeastern Ohio. I've never hunted deer out of state, um, just southeastern Ohio for the most part. And uh, pretty big, pretty good part of the country. Like yeah, you have to pick I mean, a spot. There, it's there's big deer pretty, here. Pretty darn good. Yeah. And uh, you know, I killed my first. I, I'm okay. Two hundred inch deer back in '91, and in '91, you know, I shot it. It was as gross as two hundred. Netted 194 and five eighths, non typical, 176 and a half typical. Back then, that was a pretty big deer. 
and actually in the county I shot it in, it was the biggest deer killed to that point, and then it, and it was for the next 15 years. Of course, things have changed now to where there's big deer killed frequently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've killed a couple other pretty decent ones around the area. Mm -hmm. But so I've got three 200 inch gross 200 inches. Right. They would that's, net 200 inches, but they'll we, gross 200 that's inches. That's all we talk about here is gross. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the last one I killed, it, it is probably not even a scorable deer, but you, you put a tape on it, and it's 200 and 202 and a half. Yep, awesome deer. And that that uh, that deer you killed in 17? 16. 16? Okay, just, just a couple yeah. years ago, yep. Um, what about you, Michael? I mean, when your dad's, I guess growing up in a household where your dad's killing giant deer it's yeah it's you got a little bit to live up to at this right, point right i mean uh i don't kill very many deer to be honest with you i've, I've, I've killed two bucks uh-huh i've missed a couple uh-huh uh, actually one was one of dad's 200 inch deer i missed them two weeks prior or two weeks before um he killed it from the same stand so you gave him the spot gave yeah. oh yeah that's he how was pretty much. The shot i mean off. he did put the stand there yeah. in pretty good spot <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh other than that, uh, my first buck, uh, I hunted him for three years pretty hard, just that deer, and we could never kill him. He would summer behind our, we got two pieces of property pretty close to each other, just small chunks, but he would summer behind our old house. Then come season, he'd disappear for about two weeks, Then we'd locate him at our other piece of property where we live now, and saw that happen year three years in a row the third year before I even got a picture of my, on the other property i was able to get him killed so what's he the was, what's the what was the distance there from one property to the next mile and a half okay anyway name that far the way the crow flies hell i don't know something like that it's only a half mile half from mile. one end of the property to the other well yeah uh, you I know guess. what i mean yeah i mean the properties are about a half mile yeah, long that could be okay but from where we're actually hunting them yeah a mile yeah ish and then uh Oh, that deer he grossed one sixty seven. The year year prior to that he was I'd say mid eighties. Couldn't get him killed. Saw him from stand a few times. Dad saw him from stand once breeding a doe. That deer took consumed a lot of our time for a little while. Sure did. Yeah. Got the sheds off of it from part of the sheds anyway, don't Yeah, uh, we've one, got one or two. The year, first year we hunted it we got both sides off of him, but he was a hundred and seventy inch deer that year. Um I finally ever killed one other deer, and that was my 187. We, I saw him from the road one day. I was like, man, that's a big damn deer. I mean, Dad went back through there a couple of days later. He's out in this bean field again. just caught a glimpse of him. And this is summertime? Like this, summer? Yep. He was, okay. might still August. been in velvet. Um, Dad knew the guy on the, with the property on the back side, and he always wanted us to kill coyotes. We had and asked him if we'd hunt deer, too. Hung a bunch of cameras couldn't find him so dad made friends with the lady across the road the <laughs> other direction from the property we'd seen him helped her out a little bit and we were able to get on that deer over there i only had one huntable tree i was using a climber there was one tree on the property i'd get in on a little finger it just happened to be the right tree and that was 17 also 17 so you guys had a pretty well i guess that big deer was killed in 16 my deer was killed in 16, 16 and yours was 17 i hit no. a big deer in 17 that's the what I well, I don't remember what killed. year it was. The one eighty nine and whatever your buddy ended up. Yeah. And I hit him in the shoulder. Yeah, that's right. Made a bad shot. So you guys I guess uh alluded to a couple of things right there, but I just want to go ahead and ask the question. A lot of people think when they see or hear guys talk about killing big deer, um, and it's just not luck of drawing straws, like you guys are, are doing it. On a somewhat regular basis, not every year, but because yeah. it's 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 hard to even find a deer of, yes, that, it is. of that caliber. But in reality, you guys are doing it with some consistency, and a lot of folks think that you're probably hunting either giant acres or giant uh, tracts of land, you know, large large acreage, or you know, well manicured farms with low pressure, no you know, you're not competing with neighbors. That ain't it, the case. No, like, that's, that's not how it works. We're scared every year we pick out normally half a dozen deers like, man, it'd be nice this deer makes it till next year. 
if we got half a dozen, we're lucky if one seems to make it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, 130-inch deer, they're shooting them. It's right. just most of our works. property, that I own a few, luckily enough to own a few little pieces, and most of it's 50, 80 acres 50 to big, 84 acres. Biggest. That's yeah. it. Right. Now, we do have a little bit leased around that, but it came with hunters. Mm-hmm. And uh, – I don't know how that's going yet. <laughs> yeah, these deer are far from unpressured. Yeah. That, that's, and I think, what makes the deer hardest to hunt. And we have a 50-acre, we've got tree stands all around us, you know. Property. Of course, lines. the neighbors think we own it, and it's all, it's great, you know. Right. And it ain't every year. Right. But they they we get a lot of pressure around us. Yep. So, <clears throat> two questions. On these small, on these small parcels, um, what kind of, what kind of work, if any, are you doing? Dad put in a shitload of food plots this year. I mean, 23 acres of beans, I believe. I mean, there's... But that's strung out it's several strung properties. Out. I mean, right. the biggest food plot we got is what, three acres? A few maybe? acres, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a bunch of small ones. I don't really know if they do as so much good half the time, but feeds deer, keeps some It's got to keep them. got to be better We're not, than we're not killing deer over these food plots. It's just to keep deer around. Right. So we right. put, we have food plots. We have corn we dump on the ground mm-hmm. or have a feeder. Yep. Um, like I say, you can't hardly kill something over it, but it's nice to have. And our mineral sites, are all, it's all good for a good inventory of what you got. So th- I'm assuming that that probably plays into, like, the food, feeders, minerals. That plays into how you guys are using your cameras, which oh, we'll yeah. get to later <coughs> specifically. Yeah. But It's nice to have any of the food sources we provide. It's nice to have a camera on it. Not saying we ever see anything on it or not, but depending on what time of year, we'll we'll hit the food food sources pretty hard with the cameras. It just sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And some of our properties are fifty acres. Well, there's only three stand sites on it. You know, yeah, I mean, right. it's not like we got fifty acres all woods and you could put stands all over. It's of all the land you got, own, better than half of it's tillable ground. Yeah, I mean we're not hunting big woods. No, a lot of some of it's small. So even though you have maybe fifty acres here, eighty acres there, seventy five acres there, they're pieces that aren't hunting very big. Right, no. probably not a lot right. of topography. No. Like you said, a lot of it's probably is or is either tillable or fallow fields or something yep. that yep. is not hunting very big for fifty acres. It's no, some of it's not. Some of it's got more woods than you know. Mm-hmm. One place we've got. 68 acres yeah and, that and it's got heavily wooded 63 acres of woods you know but it, it, it's still still people hunting all around you and it's it's very difficult to yeah i think um you know guys get obsessed with big deer and uh they look at states like iowa and illinois wisconsin ohio and they think i'm just it's easy. Everybody kills them. Like, yeah, they're they're around, easy, especially this year. around all over Facebook. Like I, I could just go anywhere. And yeah. It's a lot harder. Uh, than I wish it was that easy. I wish it was. We spent a lot of time looking for a deer without being able to find one. So, obviously, owning a trail camera company, you know, Jake and I, we run a lot of cameras. You guys run a lot of cameras. It definitely helps. It definitely helps. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely tips, you know, tips the scale for you guys. But when you're after a specific um, – caliber deer i guess mm-hmm. like, i'm not that level jake's not that level it's a totally different it's a totally totally different animal um and john you've you've touched on this a couple of times but um talk about like some of the work that you guys do through the season to actually find a deer to even go after and, and hunt because <clears throat> i i i guess i kind of know the answers to some of this but we're sitting it's it's uh, november 15th right now and Michael and I were just out pulling cards a little bit earlier, and you're nothing. still you're still I ain't not. Got, I ain't got one to hunt. Anything. So, talk about, I guess, uh, what goes into all that. I think we might be lucky to not have one 400 chunk acre chunk. We might be better off having a half a dozen small places. Uh, at least we got a half a dozen different places we could have deer instead of one mm-hmm. that may get hit by the car. But it's. Uh, as long as we got him on our property, I mean, we have our food plots, we have feeders, we have minerals. Uh, if we can get him on our property in the daylight, that's a big thing. You know, we we don't have that many different stand sites, you know, that right. you can put in some of these. So 
you know, we try not to pressure them and hunt. Michael was better at it than I am. I hunt when I have time and as much as I want to hunt. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hunt when I want to hunt where he might watch the moon charts a little more and pay more attention to that. But right. I'm uh, maybe not that good a hunter, but I'm pretty persistent. <laughs> and uh, for the most part, now that I have time. So you... This is something that uh, we should probably ask more people, but you're saying you would rather have, let's say, I don't know. Um, 10 40-acre chunks yeah. or one 400-acre yeah, chunk? Yeah, ex exactly. You would rather have a bunch of smaller pieces where you could hunt I different. think you have a better chance because you don't always have – we don't always have a big deer, you know, on or our, our, on our around our property. I mean, we might have big deer that spend the, the summers, uh, you know, come – behind our one house and come first week of second week of september they're gone we never see them again right um i don't know if they would be there if we had 400 acres or if they would have moved off but a lot of times we'll you know between a few counties that we hunt we'll have a nice deer somewhere one year we had two nice deer that's pretty convenient but well, so you're on the same boat then. You'd rather have the 10 40 acre chunks yes. versus a 400 acre chunk. It would be, there's pros and cons to either one. Well, yes. if you have a big chunk, dude, you could let some deer walk and really grow some deer. Mm -hmm. But, uh, we deer, don't have they, that luxury. No, we don't have so that luxury. So it's not really I an guess, option to I have guess, a yeah. 600 acre area. You know, we don't have it. If, right. Yeah, make the, make do right. with what we got. Yep. I guess that's the best way to look at it. But, I mean, we're bouncing all there. We cover a lot of ground. I mean, we we get a lot of different deer on our trail cameras. If uh, you only had a 400-acre chunk, you're going to have those deer figured out. If you got 10, 40-acre plot or 40-acre tracks, I think you're going to have more deer on your camera than if you had one 400-acre track. Potentially, yeah. I yeah. mean, I really, I think you'll come across more yeah, different Yeah, I mean, deer. if you take... <clears throat> You know, if you had take a 400-acre chunk and say, okay, a, a buck's home range is 500 acres, mm -hmm. and you start, you know, drawing circles and have those circles lit, you know, eclipse one another, you're only hunting two, three different herds with one being probably its primarily uh, its home range, mm -hmm. where you're scattered around different counties with 10, 40-acre chunks at 40 acres. I, I, mean, I think you're better off to find a big deer that way, mm -hmm. but... You no. don't. You have a hard time letting some of these deer pass at that point, though. Yeah, they're not. You got more yeah, neighbors involved. You let them go, the neighbor shoots them or wounds them or whatever. But they get hit by a car. Or who knows? So how do you guys show back up? How do you guys deal with that? Are you guys like I know in a lot of different states, uh, guys will form co-ops or at least talk to their neighbors. Um, have you guys done anything? Made the attempt. We've talked to our neighbors, but. Their idea and our ideas are different. Right. And a 130-inch deer or 140-inch deer, for the most part, they're shooting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, now we have a, a couple guys that will let them go, right. you they, know, and try. They've and, got the same but, idea we do. Huh? So we've got some that have the same idea we yeah, do. Yeah, but they're, it, it's difficult. So it's just like basically. If you want to drink a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's basically like anywhere else across the country. Yeah, you know, I'm sure they, everybody runs into the same problems. Right, and same, same stuff, same stuff. So um, I guess now you're – you, John, you, you kind of mentioned this before, but I guess your hunting styles are probably a little bit different. A little bit. So, Michael, we'll start with you. Um, so once you find a deer, like what's, the, what's your thought process – uh, look like when you go to make a move and actually hunt them are you looking for certain patterns are you looking at weather are you looking at the moon transit times phases are you hunting pre-hung stands are you hanging bang like what's like what's what do you do oh well i rely on trail cameras heavily i mean you gotta know that deer's there to begin with that 187 i killed we knew this deer was there and we had seen him there several times before i ever made my first sit as the wind was our biggest factor on that one the day the uh, wind changed, 180 degrees, his path, he was heading the other direction. That deer kept his nose to the wind pretty much any time we saw him, except for the one time I didn't see him with his nose to the wind, time I was able to kill him. 
But uh, I tried to watch the moon. I don't know how much that means. That some of it, you can see some correlations there. Makes sense. Uh, wind's really the biggest thing at this point. Trying not to burn out a spot before it's ready. So you're you're pretty much letting a deer dictate when yes. when he's killable, and yep. then you're going in. Yep. When you think you have I to. went and killed this deer about a month after we first started hunting him. He disappeared for a couple of weeks. Um, I, I've only got two deer to really make examples of anything out of, so you'll hear me repeat this a lot. But uh, well, you're following a lot of deer, and yeah, we follow some deer. Yeah, I mean, you learn. But uh, he started showing up in the mornings, right at daylight. He's right by my stand for about three mornings in a row. So I said, I'm gonna go in there now early. I go in there now early. I heard deer run off. Check the camera after that set. He was in there. I'm like, well, shit. Next morning, I go in two hours early. I get in there. I hear deer blowing at me. I don't know what they were. That deer ended up coming in a couple hours later. I was able to kill him. So, I mean, cameras are the biggest thing to tell you where what you need to do. Wind, all, wind's pretty important. rest of it, <clears throat> I think there's correlations there, but I don't think you can always rely on it. Yep, got it. His problem is he's got a job. Yeah, this year I'm not any chance I get. He get, he's got to work. Yep. I don't have a job so much, so I get a hunt. So he's if he's going to take a day off work, we got he's got to look at his schedule, make sure we don't have a shutdown, and we, you know, uh -huh. and then if the, everything's right, he can just take a day off. Right, right. But other than that, he's got the weekends sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. I mean, so I normal, <clears throat> normal, normal blue collar guy, probably. A, like a lot of the, a lot of the guys listening to the show, got to work. Work comes first, yep. hunting comes second. Yep, it's November fifteenth, and I've hunt. I've made one sit. Yeah, I don't envy that. I've been trying, but it just ain't happening. Yep. I follow that the moon and stuff less because I have more time. I hunt when I want to hunt. When I have time to hunt, if there's a big deer around. I'll bounce around my area as much as possible, which is sometimes limited. Mm -hmm. uh, watching the wind, and, and the wind is always my biggest thing, especially on the one particular farm that I'm hunting this year. Uh, wind is horrible almost all the time. What do you do in a case like that? Because like, you know we, we like haven't figured it out yet. It burned yeah. us last year. It burned us hunting that 200-inch deer a couple of years ago. Yeah. We we both hunted all of November. Yeah, I, mean, I, I saw it once from a stand, and then – in november and he ended up killing it in december but the wind dude you couldn't couldn't predict it yeah it says it's out of the west you get in some of those hollows we were really struggling to it, keep it in our favor it's a it's problem swirled. down there it's a real problem um i ain't, i don't know the solution other than Just i still not. bounce around I, then that particular area we got a bigger area we can hunt and uh, we hit it pretty hard but that is a big problem most of our places, the deer might pass through us eating or occasionally they'll bed on us. But most of the time on a 50-acre plot, they're not spending that much time on you. They're coming right. in one side, out the other, or right. we try to have as much on our land to be as attractive as possible. And, you know, come November, hopefully we're holding a lot of does and they're out spending time. But so you guys are doing a lot of a lot of your stand time in november during the rut pretty much yep i mean there's times i've hunted every day in november until gun season mm -hmm. i may not hunt all day but hunt a morning or evening or be in the woods every day right and uh i've been in the woods quite a bit this year but it had very little luck this year or success mm -hmm. but i look on my wall and there's a number of deer i can say that was the second time i was in that stand that was the first time I seen him out of the, that's, that was the first time, you know. Right. So you only got seen once. Yep. And uh, if you, if you see him one time and have one good opportunity, consider yourself pretty lucky and you better take advantage of it. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? I know what you're talking about. You're rubbing it in. Um, how hard is that mentally, though, when you're after a big deer, you're you're bouncing around a piece of property, you're not catching up with him. I mean, it gets frustrating. You're doing right. So, it is frustrating. Every now and then, you got to take a kind of back up and regroup. And, and uh, you know, I had to come home from the farm over there uh, and spend a couple of days here and take care of some business. And, mm -hmm. 
And I was kind of ready, you know. It's like, oh, I'm kind of ready, ready to be away from there for give me a couple yep. of days off, you yep. know. And now I'm ready to go back. But so on these uh, on these smaller pieces, you know, they don't hunt very big. When you're going in and like, I guess, bouncing around on these specific big deer, are you guys doing like any any boots on the ground uh, scouting, or or you really relying really 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 heavily on what the cameras are saying our, we know our land pretty well yeah you know what i mean we're hunting the same chunks for the most, most part, part year after year mm-hmm. you kind of got pattern figured out i mean never hurts to walk through see what new scrapes are popping up but i cameras are telling us when these deer are showing up 90 percent of the time got it if i'm hunting the farm like i'm hunting over i've got nine cameras out but i won't check a camera unless i'm hunting beside it right. close uh, so it may set for a while however long until i'm Walking in or walking out and go buy it, I'll check it. Right. Now, if we're hunting other, these other, or not hunting, but if we're uh, checking cameras other places we're not hunting, we go check them. Right. But in that particular case, I'm hunting over there. I don't, I don't make a trip in unless it's hunting. Gotcha. And uh, I still haven't done any good. So those cameras, um, I'm going to assume that they're adjacent to stand locations or whatnot. Uh, not, some more in and out. Just, just yeah. Just in an area, you know, I got the gist of where he's spending some time. And, you know, I think I may know where he's bedding part of the time and where he's feeding part of the time. And So really low pressure, not trying to be intrusive. Then I try to hunt every day and try not to bother him, and it's really difficult, especially yeah. a bad wind. So it doesn't make any sense, but that's kind of do the best you can with what we have to work with. So I, I believe that uh, that deer you killed in – 16 a 202 was killed on that property yes so walk us through now you're on another big deer on that property walk us through the process of tagging that deer in 2016 a 202 like what that looked like because that wasn't a rut that was not if my memory serves me correctly that was not a rut deer i mean that you may december, have hunted them. december 15th i killed him right the high that day was 12 mm-hmm. and uh i had cameras out and we honestly we had a little corn out mm-hmm. and uh we try not to, I try not to track in and out, but I would just go over. We put corn out, maybe go back in a week and put more corn out, and we just dumping it on the ground. We hunted that deer the year before. I'm going to say it was a 180s typical, good looking, clean deer. Um, we got a couple of feeders out there. Never once did he eat out of a feeder, whether it was a gravity feeder or a uh, spinner. Broadcast, yeah. yeah. Never once he'd come by him. He never once. I never once got a picture of him picking corn off the ground underneath the feeder, and uh, it was a real struggle. And we have other guys that do hunt that area that have the land leased around us. I get to hunt theirs. They hunt mine. Whenever they're down, I usually just leave, but try to give them a little space. But mm-hmm. and they usually come down and hunt a few days in both season, and mostly they gun hunt. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would just – I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> we would well, just uh, uh, hunt around him a little bit, uh-huh. and uh, the, we couldn't kill him beforehand. He messed him one day. Yeah, and that was – Before corn was on the ground or anything, it, we were we, – we've had a couple stands up that we thought was in the right area, but we didn't put corn up until – well, they left on Wednesday of gun season, so I think I put it up thurs put out some out Thursday, mm-hmm. and then I ended up killing him the fifteenth. Okay. Uh, but so the previous year, he was running around all over the place. I never laid an eye on him. Very inconsistent with the camera. Very inconsistent. Do you think uh, what? Now you guys run a lot of cameras, and you you're the kind of guys that study deer and get to know a specific deer when you're hunting them. Are deer camera shy? I, yeah, absolutely i like deer have At different times. personalities yeah I mean, you got some they don't care to have their picture taken that deer we're talking about right now we've got a pic we've got a series of pictures that's why we quit using a five shot burst you can watch them come into the frame look at the camera took a 15 second break took five pictures of the deer backing up away from the camera really yes and that's yeah. the same deer uh, that would not come into feeder. Come in a feeder yep wouldn't come into it so and uh, would he was that the kind of deer like did he rule the roost or it was like he getting pushed around like was I he never, just timid we never seen enough of him right to, he was hard to get on camera to, we didn't to do that he was spending some time there most of the time he was a tough night. deer to figure out 
uh, I think he was the deer there. You know, mm -hmm. he was the guy. Right. Uh, Big old deer. Yeah. Nice mature deer. And between that year and the following year, somewhere he got hurt a little bit and kind of messed him up. And uh, he had a big indentation in his back. Um, and like I said, that's car what or maybe messed or the other side up. Um, it was. And that's. Yeah, that, that one right there. They say he wouldn't net score anything. And uh, but he's got a lot of inches. And he's probably got 10 inches broke off. It's a big deer. But. But it is very, uh, I don't want to say stressful, but disappointing, aggravating, especially if you only got one deer to hunt mm -hmm. and you're working your butt off and nothing you do seems to work. So what was the story with you, like, you missed him, obviously. Yeah, so he what? caught me off guard. I showed a shot. It wasn't that good. It's when the <laughs> other hunters showed up. First morning they were hunting. The deer was trying to skirt around them. He was coming through pretty quick. I got him to stop, but. Shot right under his belly. The end result is he missed. Yeah, I missed. Yeah. Uh, and what made it worse is we thought we were hunting 170 some inch deer. <laughs> then <laughs> yeah, I, was, I then I was working. I get this picture of this deer. I'm like, well, that got him. That's good. Then next day, put tape on it. It's like 202. I'm like, well, shit, I missed 200 inch deer. Yeah. I've noticed. Uh, like just going through trail camera pictures that you guys like we start talking inches you guys are very conservative and a lot of times it's the other way like you talk to somebody and they'll, they'll say oh it's 160 inch deer and it's a 145 inch deer right like i'd rather guys, tell you i'd rather be you guys are like uh, i think you guys do that on purpose sometimes i like be, be like, a little bit low i know much rather i know don't aim 30 inches low but i like to be a little bit low yeah that deer was kind of a hard one to guess. Yeah. And, well, yeah. and, and it's kind of, you know, it's got several points and yeah. stuff. It's kind of odd. Right. Yeah. But and we had a lot of pictures of it, a lot of good pictures. But but he didn't want his picture taken. No. Nah, we start, you have to hide the cameras tough. up high and, and stuff. Yep. Now, other deer, they pose. The they deer this year, he'll eat out of a feeder. He don't give a shit. But so let's talk a little bit about how you guys are specifically using cameras. Like, generally... I would say you guys are using them for just inventory purposes. Yeah, I mean yeah, we, we the start running part. them pretty early. We're look, we're just looking for deer, see what's yeah. out there. But then once you find your deer, what like what are you guys doing with cameras? I mean, are you guys bouncing you're, you're around? You've already said that. I mean, the, the, you knew that deer is camera shy, so that you're starting to pull oh, cameras yeah. up in the air Absolutely. and move them off of feeders and do different things. So you, obviously, you guys are thinking about the we thought try process to, of getting them actually on camera. I mean, you want them on camera for sure. We do. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of get the gist of, you got six or eight cameras on the farm. He only, you only get him on one camera. Well, he's probably spending more time closer to that camera than he is the other one. But, uh, the deer this year that I'm trying to hunt, he's very inconsistent. He'll be up, up on a camera on one side of the property and for a day. And the next evening he's down on the other and he's not on two or three cameras hardly ever in a one evening or one night morning. Um, so we just kind of, we've got a limited amount of area to hunt. So as long as he's on our property, at least we got a shot, mm -hmm. you know. And with the wind the way it is, you just, we don't know. It's just a guess. Persistence. A lack of. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I was thinking about deer, but. <laughs> What deer? The one he's on. I was just thinking. Um, what he's Similar thinking about situation is coming... to what we had with that deer up there. He wasn't consistent either. Do you guys think, though? I think he sat there and watched us walk up that hill half I the time. I think he did, too. So you think he was bedded? I think he bedded, and if we come in from one direction, he which knew. was a common direction to come in from, I think he laid up there, and he could see a lot more than we thought. So what – here's another question for you guys. Um you're hunting some of the same parcels over and over, and you're running a lot of cameras. You guys get a lot of pictures of deer. Are you guys going back, like, year over year and saying, okay, well, this deer was on camera last year on this date, this area? <clears throat> Ask me on January 5th of this year. Yep. That's why I'm We had a big one show up January 4th last year. Okay. On a, on a particular place that hadn't been there all year. Not a 
We had pictures of him in January and maybe a little bit of February. Yeah. I didn't get a hunting much. Michael hunted it. Seen him a couple oh, times. Oh, yeah. yeah. I saw him from and, stand uh, three times. But our, my plan will kill. be to probably check out that theory uh -huh. this that, year. But you're, you I'm, haven't done it up up until this point? Not that much, no. no. Well, I'm I mean, hoping you kill that deer you're hunting so I can do that over there by myself. We'll see. But that's that's my game plan right now because I don't have a shooter. What about uh, – what's your take on the historical – um, I don't think all the deer are the same, but we have seen it happen numerous occasions. Right here behind the house, three years in a row, we had a deer show up. Uh, he showed up when we were feeding corn. It was getting cold mm -hmm. three years in a row. It ended up being a 160-inch deer that final year before one of the neighbors hit him. He never found him. He never showed up after that either. It was a nice deer. But that first deer I killed, same thing. He'd show up in one spot, summer there. Uh, spend November, December over here. Come January, he's back where he was summer. I mean, I, I think it depends on the deer, but some are some are pretty consistent. If you can tell one deer from another from year to year, you right. know, but some of these deer, some are of them are pretty obvious, pretty obvious. But you know, yeah, you get to the know bigger them. ones. You get to know. You, There's a lot of 140 inch deer that you can't tell from one year to the next. Right. You know, well, that's you know, we talk about annual trail camera day a lot and that's one of the things that you know don higgins talks about it a lot of a lot of guys talk about it and sometimes it's easier for me personally to go back and look at some of that stuff because i'm hunting areas pretty low deer densities mm -hmm. so if you see a like a mainframe clean 10 like it's very easy to go back okay let me go back to 17 it's very easy to go back and figure out what deer that was or look at you know a bend in his brow tine or whatever yeah because there aren't a lot of deer that are going to have that those type of characteristics but if you're in high deer density areas and you're that's, you have so that's many damn pictures, at. it it starts to become hard to say, okay, well this was a a ten this was a ten pointer that, that we had last year, but he had a whatever he had, he was a nine and mm -hmm. you know not yeah. this year he has a split brow tine or he's growing stuff off his base. Right. I mean, some of these deer, there's no doubt about it, from one year to the other, stay pretty similar. That deer right there doesn't look anything like he did the year before, but it's the only deer we had that size. 99% sure that was the deer he was hunting the year before. Mm -hmm. Acted the same. You know, mm -hmm. did a lot of the same stuff. Mm -hmm. But I also killed a one of those deer up there, maybe 160s or something, 170, uh, that I killed it. And the neighbor brought a shed over that he had found about two weeks after I killed that deer. I don't know if it was, I mean, it looked so much like it. I don't know if it was the same off of that deer. The shed had been laying there for a year. It's in pretty good shape. It was too. in great shape. Or if that was his brother, but you would bet quite a bit of money it was the same deer. I mean, they're just mm -hmm. very comparable. So, I don't know. You know, I don't. Is that, um, I know you guys pick up a lot of sheds. I don't know how much time you actually spend shed hunting per se we pretty high deer density but they're not hard pretty. to come across but is that something you guys look at as just like as well like oh yeah i mean that's information to use i mean we end up hunting some of these deer up till the end of season you find that shed a couple weeks later it might tell you something you need to know for next year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we have like all this talk about big deer um Michael, you shared a story about that the last the last year that you killed that 187. John, you, you shared the story about the uh, 202 that you killed in 2016. What about those other two 200-inch deer? That deer double drop time, like almost perfectly symmetrical. Like that's that's a once in a lifetime. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not either. But I doubt that you. Uh, kill another you have no faith in me i don't i have faith in you i i have faith in you i just don't think you ever see another deer like that could be right uh -oh. uh, we got something quacking um so why don't you give us the give us a rundown on those other other two giants that drop time was what 2006 i was, was in out. eighth grade whenever it was <laughs> i remember seeing him out the window one day yeah um we'd seen him last day of june out in a out in a bean field and I, it looked like about a 140-inch deer with some, some drops. You know, nice deer, but last day of June. And uh, 
I don't think we've seen him again probably until October. Uh, we, we got we were running one trail camera at the time. Yeah. And we got a picture of him right underneath my tree stand two hours after I'd left that evening. Yeah, but that was later. Before, we hadn't – I think I'd seen him one day out in the field in the rain or something, and but I'd never seen him out of a stand or anything. Uh, we had a trail camera out on a scrape. Actually, in front of his tree stand, I had set up for him. And uh, it he had come out of his stand. He'd, he'd, seen a, he'd seen a deer in, heard a deer, whatever. It was in, and, and uh, we checked that trail camera, and there he was. I'd already had a couple stands hung in the area, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, shit. He's put on a lot of inches, you know. And uh, so I started hunting a little harder then. And uh, wait a minute. If you were only in eighth grade, you probably weren't allowed to hunt by yourself. Well, you probably need to rethink that. About this. <laughs> uh, statutes of limitations up on that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I had a place I thought he could be and I, w you know, everything was right. I went in and, um, uh, first of November and had him come in and he was like 15 yards from me for s several minutes. I'm standing up ready to draw, but he was behind some stuff. I couldn't get a shot and he was nervous and, uh, he was there for, seemed like forever. And, uh. Finally, he turned around, and I got to pull back on him. It was a been a low percentage shot, and thought better to wait and let him go. It was it was not a good shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was by that time he was forty yards, and it, it, I shouldn't have shot, so I didn't shoot. So I just once he went out of sight, I got down, went got out of there. Probably went home and had a beer and thought about it, and I went back the next evening. And he was that was he was in early. And I went back the next evening, <clears throat> and I'm sitting there, and I can't quit staring back where he come from, and and nothing. I'm, you know, you look at your watch, and it's like nothing. And uh, I probably had, I don't know, 20 minutes of shooting light left, and here he come. I hear something, and here he comes from a 50 yards the other direction, and he comes down, hits a trail, and it's like he's going the wrong way. And he looks right and he looks left and he turned right and uh you know come i don't know what he was 25 yards and uh i double lunged him and of course we shoot and he took off and crashed into a tree and i thought a, a deer that has all these senses about him is not running into a, right. a dead tree you know knock the tree small. down yeah I you know, it was just a, tree stand. Was a, a small yards tree away. but knocked it i mean he run slap into it and he didn't go another 50 yards and was piled up but so was that deer coming like was he coming from his bed to food or bed. was that we didn't you're in the middle of a thicket yeah i mean it was thick he was probably coming to food but he'd uh -huh. come from his bed i knew where he, we we knew in the vicinity of where he was bedding yep. and, and he kind of come from that direction and through some thick thick stuff and you know that was it but but that was the second time i'd seen that deer out of the stand Night so the before, same stand. Same stand. Night before, the next night I killed him. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I killed the one back in uh, 91, going back a few years. Um, I'd found a shed. Seen him in, like, December or something the year before. Um, I'd already killed a deer. And my wife, actually, my wife was hunting a little bit. I took her over. She sat in a tree a couple times. And she hunted. She didn't hunt much. <laughs> um, I think we were just hanging out together in a tree, yeah. you know. But anyway, uh, we went back, and I looked for the sheds and found both sheds. And he was uh, mid-150s, guessing that he spread and all. And uh, so we went, kept got his sheds, went back in the next year, and I'd set up some tree stands and didn't hunt them until there's a little area where it just kind of pops after, you know, first part of November. And I think it was like November 2nd. Um, I went in there and it's tore up, rubs, scrapes all over. And, you know, I'm hunting in a tree 15 feet in the air. There's not many trees to get in. It's, it's not great. And uh, I don't know, early he come in. Him and another little buck come in, and 
and I didn't make quite as good a shot as I would have liked, but he didn't know. He never knew he'd been shot, I don't believe. He took, uh, I shot him. He he just took a jump, walked off 60, 70 yards, laid down, head up. It was pretty much, I think it was liver, maybe a lung, and uh, sat right there, and I sat and watched him till it got dark, and and uh, right about dark, I could I heard him roll over, and uh, I thought I think he's done. But I got out, snuck out, come back a little bit later, and he was he was laying right there. But that was a uh, first big deer I killed. A pretty big deal, in 1991. 91, that was a big deer. Yeah, yeah two inch deer in 91. That's that's a big deer. Yeah, you know. And uh, so did you know? I mean, you picked the sheds up mid 150s deer. You saw him on the hoof. Did you know? We didn't know he's too. I'd never seen him before I killed him. Right. You know, and, and I still didn't know. I mean, all I know, he's, he's big enough. I'm shooting him. Right. But then you get a tape on him and taped out pretty good. That was the last deer I ever had officially scored. Really? Mm -hmm. And that is yeah, typical that with a kicker off his yeah, right G2, couple. giant brow tines. Yep. Yeah. 13 and, or 14 inch G2s on that deer? Uh, I don't remember. They're pretty good. Good brows. That's, I mean, yeah. he had what he needed. Uh, whether it's accurate or not, uh, you know, I saved the bottom jaw. We we did some shooting over around Hawking Tech, and I took the jaw over to some of the, we we knew some of the folks over there. Mm -hmm. and they aged it as a three and a half year old deer. True or not, I don't know. Yeah, probably not. I can't it's imagine. It's hard but to believe. I know every, anything after two and a half is kind of a guess, but educated guess. But My I got to think he was probably not a six-year-old deer, though, I don't think. I don't know. I, don't know. I can't imagine him being three and a half. Of course, they say that's possible, but I, I don't know. If the, the whole teeth thing to me, it's like. What are they eating? And well, that's, that's I, just I mean, it. You get a deer. This is all hardwoods where I shot him at. I mean, it, there's it's not eat crop fields right. and very abrasive yeah. twigs brush brows acorns like a deer like that i feel like his teeth are going to wear more which would mean that deer would actually age older i mean the, than an, a deer that's eating I, beans and uh, it seems that way although we work in ethanol plants and mm -hmm. and you learn uh the equipment that moves corn is, is corn is pretty abrasive yeah true you know some I of guess. the stuff wears out pretty quick yeah you know but uh -huh. Um, anyway, I don't know how old he was. I don't care how old he was. I was pretty happy yeah, with it. Doesn't, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Yeah. As long as it makes, makes you makes you happy. Yeah. But I guess that's uh, when you after you after you shot that deer. Did you ever like in 1991? You probably never imagined getting on another deer like that. Well, you never know. But I mean, I mean, was that your mentality then? Like, hey, I'm actually. It almost takes a little of the wind out of your sails for the next year or so because you think, well, I mean, I'm probably it's going to be hard to outdo that, right? And the chances of coming across another one, you know, is pretty slim. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've probably killed the th honestly probably the three biggest deer I've seen in the woods. Yeah, um, something to be said about you that. know. I don't know that because of course if you don't well, kill them, you can't score them. But here's the other thing: is you have guys out there killing multiple 200 inch deer but these guys are they're going all over the place to find these deer they're going to kansas they're going to iowa they're going oh, yeah. you've done it in one state i don't know if that means much or not well, i but think it does it's that's why i don't have very many well that's i think you know they're so hard to find a deer of that caliber that's why guys are you know they're they know people in kansas or they know people in nebraska they know people in illinois because if they hear about a deer, if that's all that they're after, when they hear about a big deer, they're making phone calls and going to Kansas or going to Illinois or going wherever. Some of these guys got the time and the money to do it. Well, yeah. And are dedicated enough right. to do it. But to do it in a single state on your own, like I feel like there's a little more warrant to that than maybe. I, I mean, I don't know. That's my personal opinion on it. I can't find a hundred. 60 inch i can't find 140 inch deer in the county i live <laughs> oh, yeah uh, that's that's funny well i think uh you guys have anything else anything else you guys want to uh -huh. chat about no you got you all the information finally, now me you're probably going to get yeah pretty limited you guys are finally getting renders now 
Yeah. I guess. Uh, Pretty excited about those. That Let's talk about that for a little minute, uh, for, for a minute, because I th- I feel like when you guys are hunting specific deer, that that has to be able to change. That would really be nice. Some of our deer are in pretty remote areas where we don't have cell service, but mm-hmm. some are or not. But So what do you, how do you think, like, I know you guys have been testing uh, some on and off, but to, to have some in the field for hunting purposes, like what's your strategy, like with the deer that you're on, it's kind of hit or miss. I mean, a nice picture before you go out would sure be nice. Um, so you're going to be a little more intrusive with those cameras? I think you could well, be but we don't have to go check. You have to check them as often. You know, that, that's the thing. You go, you go in, you put it up. You may not have to go back. Mm-hmm. Hopefully, um, the deer I'm hunting this year, it, it's probably going to be limited because of where it's at, and the cell service gotcha. is, is limited. But uh, I can see it being a big advantage. And Michael, you're probably thinking, scatter those things out and cover some ground. Picture. Yep, and where around. we got service, we need to have one. Yep. And if we get on deer, we might consolidate them so we're on top of that particular deer a little better. But mm-hmm. I mean, you might know he's there that day instead of the following week when you go right. check it or two weeks or whatever it yeah. is. Personally, I think right now that's we we talked about this last week on uh, the episode on whatever November twelfth or whenever it was was. Mm-hmm. Finding, you know, you get a, you get a picture of a deer in November, and it's so crucial to have that information within right. just they're, a few they're hours because they're only, they're only going to be there for a couple of days. Yeah, you yeah. have forty eight hours, maybe seventy two hours, and then that deer is going to be gone. Yep, he's he's moving on to his, the next property, next doe, roaming yep. ground. So having up to date like, information would be most pretty nice. MRI most recent information during this time of the year is it's pretty damn crucial. Oh yeah, pretty damn <clears throat> crucial. And we've so, got parcels that are that way all year long. You know, on some of these small woodlots around here, deer might spend two days there. You're mm-hmm. not going to know he's there till he's probably gone by the time you check your cameras. Well, yeah. That's a that's a pretty good point because, I mean, um, this there's is, one this in particular I'm thinking about. There's a 10 acre chunk of woods. You go quarter mile one way, you got a big chunk of woods. Quarter mile the other way, mm-hmm. big chunk. Probably further than that, really. It seems like you'll get pictures of them for two days at a time in there, two or three days, then they're gone. Are you guys uh, on some of these smaller chunks in, in ag ground, are you guys, do you guys pay attention to crop rotation and what that does if deer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. What's, uh, what's, your, what's your take on that, Michael? Also, I like to have both nearby, but beans are my favorite. Uh, but do you see, do you see deer moving in and out of those properties at different times based on those food sources and what's planted? Like you'd uh-huh. see deer, like if if you're on a a 50 acre, let's say a 30 acre chunk that has 10 acres of of uh, huntable woods, but it's next to a you know 200 acre bean field. Mm-hmm. Are those deer doing different things at different times of the year versus that corn or that field being planted? In corn? I really don't have an answer for you on that one. No, no. I think deer could spend a whole lot of time in a big corn field. You're right. Yeah. Where with a bean field, they're probably spending prefer- more time in that chunk of woods until the beans till september you yeah. know but i think we get more deer activity in some of the areas closer to the roads if there's corn up well right behind my house if we have corn right behind our house here we get more deer activity by our creek than we do when there's soybeans there in my opinion and my farmer left corn up until like december so it worked out pretty good so so why do you what do you think that is? Just I don't know if because they're hid or if it's because there's corn and, not, and you know they got, but I think they run the creek a little bit more mm-hmm. when there's corn there. I mean you can see it from the road, right? You know it's it's right there. Just having the uh, where soybeans in August, I don't think they care about it. But when the beans turn brown and they they're not in them as much, mm-hmm. I think the activity slows. But got it understood. Just my guess. So, um, I guess we, John, we know what the rest of 2019 looks like for you. You're, I mean, continue to go in and hunt that deer. I'll, to, I'll hunt it until I killed or somebody does probably. So is that the point? Like you hunt it until it, until the end of the season? I'll, I'll like spend some time. Unless something bigger shows up somewhere. Yeah. Like I say, I, I, I know where I would. 
deer in the middle of the season before. I mean, you go from hunting one, something new shows up late yeah, season, we'll be I'll on go. Mm-hmm. I wish I had three deer because I'd get the hell away from that one because all he's doing is aggravating me right now. <laughs> but I don't have another deer. Right. Now, like I say, come January 4th, 5th, I'm going to – I'll slip down there and check out that theory. Hopefully he shows up. Right. Um, well, that's where I'm going to be. I'm I'll be just down from you. Right over that spot. <laughs> yeah. And that's a deer that uh, – you know, going back to this whole process of finding big deer, hunt, trying to hunt a big deer. Even last year, Michael, you – I don't think you hunted until after – Until that deer showed that up. Deer. And we were because at the ATA when we he were, showed up. That's what I was going to say. We were at the ATA show. Yep. And then – There are daylight pictures of him. He come out of nowhere. And that's the f- – that was the, was that the first time you sat last year? Yep. I did not hunt until that deer showed up. So, all of bow season, uh, uh, from whatever, October 1st to – Yep. October 1st, all through November, all through December, you're not in the stand until January. Right. Some of that was work-related, but some of that was not having a deer to hunt. Right. So and that's basically the way 2019's playing out. A little bit. I mean, I hunted one day, and I kind of decided I'm not going to shoot that deer down there. I got one other one I might pursue. I haven't decided on him yet. His, this is a 15-acre chunk we can hunt. Just some old lady that lets us hunt it. Can't control any of the deer. They're going to survive around there. Mm-hmm. It gets hunted around there, so mm-hmm. I might pursue him. It's 160, 165 inch deer. Mm-hmm. But I was also shot in that same area, 189 and a half inch deer. Net typical. Net typical. Well, no, it netted one, it grossed 189, 189 and seven eighths, and uh, netted 184, 80, 185. Still pretty typical clean. deer. Big, I hit him high clean, in the shoulder. Pretty deer. But yeah. we had that little chunk to hunt, mm-hmm. and I screwed it up, you know. And uh, the neighbor ended up? A friend of a friend of the neighbor. Uh, you know, uh, no, a neighbor, the neighboring farm. He killed yeah. it. Yeah. It, it. Yeah. He killed it in a uh, second gun season. Yep, I remember. It wasn't doing very well. I mean, it was. It had some issues right. health-wise. But had a bad shoulder, didn't it? It had a real bad shoulder. <laughs> I felt kind of bad. Well, I was sick after that, though. I just, I hardly hunted after that, after I hit that deer. Uh huh. I remember, well, actually, we oh, talked on the phone that night. I remember, uh, I remember the phone conversation. I was sitting in the truck. We both could have killed 180 inch deer that year if you would have killed it. That'd have been pretty cool. Yeah, it would have. It would have. So we've, uh, I guess we're closing in on an hour here. Um, anything else you guys want to touch on? Thank you. Got more out of me than I really thought I had, to be honest with you. I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. Uh, I guess that's going to be a wrap. Everyone that um, is listening to this, we appreciate all the support. If you haven't left us a review, we would very much appreciate that on iTunes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for us. Give us a thumbs up. Um, drop a comment below. Check out all these great uh, great whitetails John has on his wall. And uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>